This sermon is brought to you by Bloomfield Presbyterian Church, Belfast. To know Jesus and share his love. Our our reading this evening is taken from the book of Philippians, chapter 3, verses 1 to 9. This can be found in your church Bibles on page 1180. So reading in from chapter 3, verse 1. Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. There is no trouble for me to write the same things to you again, and it is a safeguard for you. Watch out for those dogs, those men who do evil, those mutilators of the flesh. For it is we who are the circumcision, we who worship by the Spirit of God, who glory in Christ Jesus, and who put no confidence in the flesh, though I myself have reasons for such confidence. If anyone else thinks he has reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law, a Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church, as for legalistic righteousness, faultless. But whatever it was to my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. By the grace of God, I am what I am. That's what the Apostle Paul says about himself in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 10. Grace, let's get that word right before we start. It it means what God gives us that we don't deserve. It is his unmerited favor. It is God granting to us what we had no right to expect and with nothing in us to qualify ourselves for. It's the kindness and goodness of God expressed in his love towards us in such generosity. And Paul says about himself, it's by the grace of God I am what I am. Whatever I am, whoever I am, whatever I've done, whatever I will do, I'm only that because of the grace of God. In so many of his letters, Paul had to defend himself against claims about him, saying, yeah, well, that guy, Paul, it's not, it's, not all that, well, it's not all he's cracked up to be. He's not a great speaker. He's not strong enough personality. He's not faithful enough to his Jewish heritage, or even he's too faithful to his Jewish heritage. And all the way through the, the New Testament, he's, he's speaking about himself. He's not doing that because he wants to boast about himself, but he's trying to answer the accusations that come against him and were designed to undermine him and the gospel. But his most simple and profound description of himself are these words from 1 Corinthians, by the grace of God, I am what I am. In this he boasts, in this he rejoices. It's not about him, it's not about his abilities, it's not about his track record, it's about God and his unmerited favor towards him. So when we're talking about grace, as we'll do this evening, keep that in mind. This is what Paul means, I am nothing if I am anything at all, it's because what God has done for me. I'm going to think about that specifically as we look at this reading from Philippians 3, uh, 1 to 9. Paul knew who he was by the grace of God. It's possible, of course, to state our identity without any relation to the grace of God. So, if I were to ask you, who do you think you are? I wonder what you would say. Would you answer, by the grace of God, I am this, or I am that? Or would you self-identify in a whole range of other ways that people do today regarding your culture? What is your culture? And there's a lot of debate about that in Northern Ireland, isn't there? And a lot of money going for bonfires and things like that. All kinds of things, what your culture is, or about your relationships, or your sexuality, or your self-image, or your success, or your achievements. Well, well, Paul could have answered 
with perhaps great assurance that he was a high achiever and an extremely successful person. He had been, uh, we see in the New Testament, uh, to the best places to study. He was marked out as a rising star, as a person of influence. He said in Galatians 1.14 that earlier in his life, I was advancing in Judaism beyond Jews of my own age. And he wasn't boasting. He was simply saying that was the truth. I was, I was in the advanced class. I was in, I was in the fast track. And if there'd been a, a vote for a person most likely to succeed in his year group, Paul, or Saul as he was known at the time, would have topped the poll. His CV is impressive. He sets it out in chapter 3, verses 4 to 6 here. He's from the right background. He's from the people of Israel, verse 5. He's, he's got the right connections. He's a Pharisee. He's got the right attitude. He's zealous for the law. He has a right level of achievement. He's faultless in keeping the law. And that's a big claim. There were 613 laws the Pharisees worked out. Faultless for all of them. That's some statement. And he had the right zeal. He was persecuting the church. He had it all. He was, he was the poster boy of uh, Judaism at the time. So what he goes on to say from verse 7 is astonishing in the light of this stellar performance as a leading light in Judaism. Here's all my achievements. Here is who I've made myself to be. And he says, I consider them all now a loss. All of that just a loss for the sake of knowing Christ. Indeed, he goes further in verse 8, calling his achievements rubbish. The original Greek is a bit more agricultural here, meaning dung or manure or that good old Ulster Scots word, clabber. Now, we might pause here for a moment and ask, should not a Christian want to achieve and succeed and do well? Isn't there any point in working hard at school or college or sport or seeking promotion or seeking advancement in your skills? Yes, of course there is. Paul's not saying that it's, we shouldn't work at these things. We shouldn't seek to achieve in these things. Christians should give their energies fully to the responsibilities that arise in the place where God has placed them. What are you going to do tomorrow? Are you going, if you're working, where are you going tomorrow? What are you going to be doing? You're just going to go in there and sit around? No, you're going to go in there and do the very best you can for Him. We're going to study hard, work hard, give our all on the pitch or even in training because, as Colossians 3.23 reminds us, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart for you're working for the Lord and not for people. Paul's point is that success and achievement is not that success and achievement are unimportant, but that we should understand their relative value relative to our relationship with Christ, which is far greater, far better, far of far greater value, all of these things are as a loss. You might win an Olympic gold medal. You might get a, a triple first in some university. You might become prime minister of some country, but, but it's all a loss. Knowing Christ is greater. That's what he's saying. He says, what was once for my profit or once for my gain I count as rubbish that I may be found in Him. Now, that's a really striking thing. I wonder how many of us think of our relationship with Christ like that. Well, it's quite interesting. It's, it's quite decent. It's not a bad thing to have on my CV. But you know what? The most important thing about me is that I'm at this or I'm at that or I've achieved this or I've achieved that. What are we saying there? We're saying that I and my achievement is of greater worth to me than Christ and His grace. The most important thing about me and about you is that I belong to Jesus Christ. For when I'm no longer in anything, and when all the, my achievements are forgotten about, this will be the only thing. Nothing compares to knowing Him. My wife, Elaine, here used to have a, a Peugeot 205. Uh, it was 17 years old. It perhaps wasn't uh, in, in the prime of its health, but I, I loved that wee car. I would have loved to take it out and, and drive about in it. But all that changed when she got a Citroen C3. My daughter has it now. Most things end up going to her in the end. If you have daughters, you understand that. Um, but once she got the new one, there was no way I was ever going back to the old one. 
The 205 seemed great to me at the time, but beside the C3, there was no comparison. The 205 had a manual choke, no power steering, no electric windows, no CD player, no Bluetooth compatibility. It had four wheels and four doors, and it got us from A to B, and it was great fun at the time, but, in a, but I would never swap it for the other one. Now, Paul's looking at his old life, and he's looking at his new life. And in a greater and a more profound way, Paul says, there's simply no comparison. To be outside of Christ, well, I could get from A to B, but to be inside of Christ, now that's a great joy because of His grace. The highest and best things about Paul now are not his personal achievements and success, but that he belongs to Jesus Christ, no longer with the burden of trusting to his religious performance. You know, it's it's a very wearisome thing to have to keep a whole big long list of religious rules and hope that makes you right with God. Because how will you ever know if you've done it good enough? How will you ever know if you've succeeded? It, it, it wears people down. In fact, people just give up because they know they can't do it. But the grace of God comes along and says, you don't need to do that at all. But you simply need to embrace Christ and the righteousness He gives us. Verse 9. Christianity is unlike any other religion in the world. It's unlike every, any other thought process in the world. It is a, a countercultural movement that gets us to think entirely the opposite way the world thinks. The world thinks, achieve, 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 and then you'll have value. The gospel says, Christ has died for you. You are highly loved. Receive His grace. We're encouraged by the world around us to seek success at all costs, and to measure ourselves purely in the light of that. And if anything gets in the way of you succeeding, even if it's the things of God, set them aside, because success, as the world may measure it, is more important even than Him. So, unlike Paul, the way the world thinks is that to know Christ is worthless. It's rubbish. And every other thing we strive for is actually worth having worth finding your identity, worth locating your security and your hope. Do you think like that? I wonder if you do. What about your own record achievement? Would you regard it as worthless, rubbish, for the sake of knowing Christ and being known by Him? Is that the highest thing that roots your identity? Rather than the letters after your name or the medals around your neck, Is His grace your deepest joy that gives you peace and hope? What about your quest for academic achievement? Here are my O-level results. Don't look too closely. And that's O-levels. That's like so far ago, no one even remembers them. I I put these up because no one will be jealous when they see these. For me, they were a great success because I passed, and I'm delighted that a C is a pass, or it was in those days. And there's even an A in there. I should have blown that up a little bigger than than the rest. But maybe you've got 10 A-star GCSEs, or you aspire to that, and you think, well, if I have that, I'm really something, or I'm really somebody. Well, I'm glad you're aiming high, but don't let that define you, either by getting it or not getting it. That's not the most important thing you'll ever achieve or receive in your life. You could have the best set of results in the world and have no time for Christ, know nothing of Christ, be on the treadmill of trying to to win acceptance with others through your efforts, and have no time for Christ, or you could belong to Him who gave Himself for you. Think about this the quest for sporting success. Now, I am inordinately proud of this certificate. I was the winner of the 200 meters in 1979. Now, it doesn't get much better than that, really. I mean, I think Olympics pale into insignificance beside that. But the fact is now, I can't run the length of myself. And that's ancient history. I mean, that, that really should be shredded. What matters now is my standing in Christ, not my running 40-odd years ago. You see, all of this success, it's, 
It pales into nothing if we don't have Christ and we don't rejoice in His grace. Same thing goes for this picture. Most of these people got out under the Good Friday Agreement, I think. Um, I have no idea what year this was, but note the fact it's in black and white. We were extraordinarily proud of that tiny, tiny little cup that's down at the front of it. But you know now, I have no idea what that is. I can't remember that. I don't remember even that we even got that, but we thought it was so important we'd take a photograph of it. I can't remember it. No wonder no one else can remember it. Such is fame. That's a problem with our achievements, isn't it? They mean so much at the time, but the memory of them quickly fades, and ultimately they are worthless. They're not solid enough to build our identity upon. And we have to go again and go again. What's the problem with sport? Well, after a while, you just can't do it. You can't keep up. So are you worthless then? Are you of no account? Or does our value lie elsewhere? Our achievements at the time might set us above or below others, but they don't bring us nearer to God. God is the only person with whom a relationship lasts forever, and it's the only one that counts. So all of these things, all of our achievements, which seem so great at the time, are ultimately meaningless, worthless, so much clabber. God is not interested in your record of achievement before He takes an interest in you but He wants us to see how much we're in need of Him, how helpless, hopeless, and in need of grace to find our identity, our security, our peace, our hope, our joy in Christ. In the end, all of the things we accumulate, everything we aspire to, everything we lay hold of, will mean nothing to us without a relationship with Christ. If I don't find my identity and hope and peace and joy in Him as His follower and servant and His friend, I will find nothing that truly is satisfying in life. So what is it that constitutes success for you? What will bring you greatest joy? What price are you willing to pay for it? Who or what will make it, who or what by which you will decide that you've achieved it? And how does that compare with Christ. Well, Paul in this section is listing his pedigree as a successful Jewish person, but what does he do? He counts it all as worthless compared to knowing Christ. I wonder, could you and I take all our achievements, my, my rugby team photograph, my 200-meter certificate, my O-levels with their three C's and their one A, and throw them all out and say, nothing, nothing, nothing is worth anything compared to knowing Christ. All my efforts, important as they were at the time, is as nothing compared to knowing Christ. Human striving for success or to make something of ourselves often leads us to walk over others or use them for our own ends. By contrast, if we looked at the end of chapter 2, we'd see Timothy as someone who cared more about the Philippians than he did for himself, because he didn't think first of himself, but about Christ. Or in chapter 2, 25 to 30, Epaphroditus, who calls him my brother, my co-worker, my fellow soldier, who risked his life for Paul because of Christ. What was it that motivated Paul and Timothy and Epaphroditus? It was the knowledge of who they were in Christ and who Christ had made them by His grace, and it transformed their life, and it brought them joy. That's why Paul begins the chapter by saying to the Philippians, rejoice in the Lord. If we rejoice in who we are because of our achievements, we'll never have a secure joy. They will fade and perish. Others will come up and, and, and get ahead of us in the race, and we will drop behind and, and we'll not have the strength or the energy to go forward. But if who we are in Christ be, is based on what He has done, then our identity, our hope, our security is rooted in a God whose joy is lasting and our confidence in whom is unshakable. Many times Paul had to defend himself to his accusers. Many times he confessed his own unworthiness for God's grace. He says that perhaps most strongly in 1 Timothy 1. 
I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has given me strength, that He considered me trustworthy, appointing me to His service, even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man. I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly, along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. But for that very reason, I was shown mercy, so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display His immense patience as an example for those who would believe in Him and receive eternal life. Now to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. You see, in Philippians 3, Paul could say, well, I had all these credentials. And in 1 Timothy, he's saying, well, that's worthless, useless. The greatest thing is that God has extended His grace to me in Jesus Christ. In a sermon recently, I shared the story of a man who was converted to Christ in Kilkenny uh, before I came to the congregation. He told me that the first time the Irish mission worker visited his house, he chased him. The man was a soldier, and in typically blunt military language, made it clear to him he was never to return. Yet the grace of God laid hold of him, and Pat, that was his name, who was once, like Paul, a blasphemer, a persecutor, and a violent man, was shown mercy. And by the grace of God, he became a new man, witnessing boldly to his colleagues in the barracks, because nobody is beyond God's grace. I don't know if you think there's someone that you know, or maybe you think yourself is beyond God's grace. Somebody thought Pat was, but he wasn't. When you look back over your life, can you see what you once were, as Paul did in this chapter? But are you now able to rejoice in what God has made you by His grace? Is the main thing about you, the chief identity you have, who you are in Christ, rather than being defined by the achievements you have collected over the years? What about you? Or perhaps I should ask, are your achievements holding you back from Christ? Are there things that keep you from Him because of some aspect of who you are? You, you think, uh, well, I couldn't do that. I couldn't make myself nothing. I couldn't surrender my achievements. I couldn't come down from this position I've built for myself and humble myself before Christ. Well, if you're thinking like that, make sure you're thinking wisely. Make, make sure you weigh things up carefully, because the only thing that lasts for eternity is who we are in relation to Christ. All we think about ourselves, all we possess, all we take pride in, all we value, all of it will be forgotten. Do you know the names of the parents of your great-grandparents? Do you know where they lived? Do you know what job they did? Do you know what school they went to? Do you know who they, they used to knock about with? I haven't the faintest clue. I can barely name my great-grandparents. Never mind anything before that. You see how fleeting is everything in which we trust, all the things in which we seek to strive for our own achievements, they will all evaporate. But who we are in Christ, or who we refuse to be in Christ, that alone defines us forever. So choose very carefully. Don't give your love, affection, energy, and hope to what Paul calls rubbish, making yourself something. Instead, give the passion and desire of your heart to knowing and following Christ who makes you something for Himself by His grace, giving you what you don't deserve, putting you right with God, rather you making yourself acceptable to God without Him. Does that seem foolishness to you? Does it seem that you would be throwing your life away to do something as worthless as to follow Christ? We'll ask anyone who's lived heedless of Christ and who then has become his follower, would they ever swap? Would they ever go back? Would they ever take the 205 instead of the C3? In no way would they do that. What they have now is far better. And if you ask my friend Pat what his answer would have been, 
in plain and direct and military language, he would tell you the case that the life he came to live in Christ was of far greater worth than all his life before without Christ. Just one postscript to that story of Pat is worth noting. Pat died of cancer in his mid-50s, and as he did, he declared with characteristic courage that he did not mind whether he lived or died so long as Christ was glorified. His concern was the glory of Christ, but, but God honored his saints. And Pat had a full military funeral attended by the top brass of the Southern Command of the Irish Army. His coffin was draped in the national flag. It was borne on a gun coffin through the streets of Kilkenny. The whole city came to a standstill, and over the grave, nearly deafening me, they fired a volley of shots as they buried him. Did he lose out by following Christ? By no means. In life and in death, he was shown honor and respect, for God is no man's debtor. But all of that wasn't of any consequence to Pat, really. It was that he was found in Christ, not having a righteousness of his own, not trusting in who he was or what he had achieved, but simply holding on to the grace of Jesus. Well, what about you? Who do you think you are? Do you take pride in what you've made yourself? Do you find security in the identity you've created and made your identity. Paul says, by the grace of God, by the unmerited favor of God, I am what I am. By the grace of God, you can be what he was, what Pat was, a new creation in Christ, someone whose credentials read saved, forgiven, restored, loved, a child of heaven, adopted, blessed. Can you rejoice in the grace of God to you tonight. No more striving, no more seeking, no more effort that always we know will fail us, but trusting in the grace of God for our salvation. If not, then that grace is available to you tonight through Jesus. Seek Him, and you will find Him. Amen. Thank you for listening to Bloomfield Presbyterian Church Sermon Audio. We're a congregation in East Belfast with worship services at 11am and 7pm every Sunday. For more information, visit bloomfieldpresbyterian.org.